this morning. Mark Whitaker is our senior warden, and she has some introductory remarks before we get to the main event. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to keep them really short. Um, a number of you already know this, but for those of you who don't, Mark and I just went to high school together. So we go way back. I can say I knew him when. <laughs> so um, anyway, and I actually knew his younger brother, you more because we were in the same grade, and Mark's a couple years older than I am. But anyway, fast forward 30 years, sometime last fall, and I was reading an article, um, a Huffington Post article that, um, called The New Orleans Companion. It's a fantastic article. Many of you may have read it because I reposted it to the Facebook page, Grace St. Paul's Facebook page. And when I reposted it, I happened to notice the name of the author. Huh. Mark also likes this article, so I thought he liked it. <laughs> no, 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 wait a minute. He's the author. <laughs> so um, it ends up that Mark's been very busy doing a lot of things as an attorney. He's been very successful. He's um, currently the, um, a professor at the University of St. Thomas Law School and the director of the Association for Religiously Affiliated Law Schools. Did I get that right? And a lot of his articles have been on Huffington Post and Sojourners and NPR and um, he's, he's consulted directly for NPR and CNN. So um, I, I noticed when I was reading his articles that gosh, he's got a very similar theology to, to ours. And so I extended the invitation. I said, gee, Mark, if you ever happen to be in Tucson, we'd, we'd love to have you at Grace St. Paul's. Please come. I think you'd really like it. And I was thinking, what are the chances of him coming to Tucson <laughs> from, from Minnesota? And he said, well, actually, the U of A Law School is bringing me here as a distinguished lecturer at the end of January or early February. I'd love to take you up on that. And by the way, would you like me to do something at your church? <laughs> so lucky us, this is why we have Mark here today. And um, I'm, I'd like us all to welcome him warmly. And he's going to be talking on the five sins of social justice advocacy or something along those lines. Something like that. But I think that's particularly important as um, we as a congregation, um, as we try to be the body of Christ in the world, try to affect meaningful social change, and we can't do that by just surrounding ourselves with like-minded people. We have to really engage a number of different perspectives. So please join me in warmly welcoming you, Mark. Well, it's, it's good to know that uh, Martha is still as awesome as she was in high school. <laughs> uh, and, and I'd also like to recognize Hank Shea, who's here, who's a uh, professor teaches at both St. Thomas and at the University here. And, uh, this is the person who asked me out to uh, speak. Um, although I don't think it was as a distinguished lecture, I think it was probably an undistinguished lecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, we travel different paths to the same place. And I, I, uh, I love the way that works out sometimes. Um, it's fascinating to me that sometimes when you write something, you make these connections. And uh, you find out that things that you thought you were standing alone on an island trying to do, you're not. Um, and it's people like Hank and Martha that, that sometimes give me that confidence when you read 10,000 comments to your article, most of which are uh, disagreeing with you and calling you some names. <laughs> uh, what I want to talk about today is social justice and advocacy. And when I talk about that, it's something that I'm very fortunate in that the place where I teach, the University of St. Thomas, has as part of its mission, we take our mission very seriously, the pursuit of social justice. And what that means is that <clears throat> at the same time that as a professor there, I am expected to write scholarly articles. I'm expected to teach class and uh, imbue our students with a sense of ethics, knowledge, confidence as they move forward. Um, I'm also expected to be a voice for social justice. Uh, and that is something I find really compelling. It's, it's quite a responsibility to be told to do that. Now, one of the things that's fascinating about that, and this is something I've learned really in the last two years since, since going to St. Thomas and have had to work out, is, okay, now I've got this command. Go and do social justice, but nobody's telling me what social justice is. And on a lot of the issues that I care about the most, not a lot, but some, there are members of the faculty who strongly disagree with me. So, now, I'm looking around at my colleagues, and some of them agree with me wholeheartedly, some of them disagree with me wholeheartedly on certain issues. Who's doing social justice? 
for example, one of the things in the last uh, year and a half that I've become fairly active in is that in Minnesota, <coughs> there was a referendum uh, that would have put into the constitution of the state a ban on gay marriage. Um, and I thought that was, that was wrong. It was against that amendment. I didn't think it belonged in the constitution. I, for religious reasons that I've expressed in, in writing, I don't have a problem with gay marriage either. Uh, the person in the office next to me uh, <coughs> was one of the leading, if not the leading, advocates for the amendment coming out of the academy. Uh, and she is a colleague that I have a great deal of respect for. Her arguments are rooted in her faith and their principle. So I'm saying one thing. She's saying the complete opposite. Which of us is doing social justice? Is it fair for me, I realize, to say, okay, I'm doing social justice, and I'm doing it against you, and I have to walk over you to get to social justice. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is the product of having to work through that. What does it mean to seek social justice in a place that encourages it, but has a diversity of views? I'm, this is Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> and I think this is a pretty good metaphor for what I'm going to be talking about. So, is if you're on the Baltimore Ravens, your goal for today is to win the Super Bowl. Uh, that is what they're advocating for by hitting huge people really hard. <laughs> and the San Francisco 49ers are literally opposed to them. They're going to be butting heads. Uh, now, and maybe that's something that's a good thing about advocacy, is that we're slamming into the other side like that, like the two lines in football that are all time after the ball's high. But what if the San Francisco 49ers didn't show up? What if only the Ravens were there? And they went out there and there was a forfeit, maybe they let Beyonce sing, and it was over. <laughs> <laughs> then we've got a Super Bowl victor. It's the Ravens, because the 49ers bus got lost. <laughs> when you think about that, you realize that what the Super Bowl is about isn't really about the Ravens winning. It's about something bigger than that. I'm not going to say it's a great and wonderful thing. It's about money. It's about the NFL making a lot of money, generating advertising, things like that. But it doesn't happen unless both sides show up. In terms of my relationship with this brilliant professor in the next office to me, whose beliefs draw from a very deep sense of Catholic social media. Am I doing social justice or is she? I think the answer is that we both are. That in the United States, over and over again, the base of social justice issues are what produces a truth, not one side. Uh, now, very often, one side ends up getting what they want, and the other side less so. But when we look at that, what's happened is that one of the sides has changed has been transformed by the process of that debate. I think the civil rights movement in the United States is something that's like that. Did those in favor of civil rights for the most part prevail? Yes. But in large part because the other side changed. Enough people changed their views over time. Um, so yeah, I've got, I've got five. I might, it might meld into six points. I, since I've been thinking about it more, I've added some more stuff in there. <laughs> so you get, you get extra value out of me today. But, um, the first point is this, that you're not doing advocacy unless you're talking to people who either don't agree with you or haven't made up their mind. One of the really serious flaws I see in advocacy in the public sphere today is that people talk to people who already agree with them, mm -hmm. on both sides. In 2010, uh, in November, I went to a death penalty conference in Atlanta. 
and they asked me to, to go speak, and this was, you know, <clears throat> big group, and they had these distinguished speakers. Sister Helen was there to speak to. Uh, and so I thought, this is, a, this is a great honor. I can't wait to go. And I went, and I took the stage, and I gave my talk, and people loved it, and they all said, you're so right. And then the next person went up, and, and she spoke, and everyone was like, that was great. You're so right. And that happened for two days because we all were already against the death penalty. <laughs> And we, of course we thought everybody else was great. We were all on the same side. And in my field, over and over again, I see this replicated, where someone will get a grant to have a, a, you know, an event like that, and it'll be almost all people who agree with each other. And they, they talk to one another, and they come away thinking, boy, we are not, we're not just right, we're super right. Everybody <laughs> agrees with me. Um, Within the larger sphere of discourse in the United States, we see the same thing replicated as well. That increasingly we've got two polarized media complexes that don't intersect. People watch Fox News or they watch MSNBC. Uh, when I write for the Huffington Post, uh, that's going to be a completely different audience than if I write for the Washington Times, for example. Uh, and so, and it's mostly throwing people red meat. Now, not only is that not good advocacy, it's really dangerous to our social fabric. Um, because when we reify or reaffirm people's strongly held beliefs, they often lose that edge of doubt. And as people of faith, I think you know what I'm talking about. That when you have certainty in anything, You've lost touch with reality, probably. Um, you know, right now we're seeing this spate of shootings and things like that in this country. And very often what's being articulated by the people who are the shooters are, I had to assert my rights, my gun rights. Now that's not rooted in reality, that you're asserting your gun rights by shooting someone who's innocent. But it's that closed circle. So how do you break through that? How is it that that you're going to be able to get an audience with people who don't agree with you, or have a conversation with people who don't agree with you. Um, because we're loath to do that. Part of our instinct to talk to people who agree with us is it's very affirming. <laughs> I mean, when I, when I went to the uh, conference in Atlanta when I first realized this, I mean, it was, I, for a while, until I thought about it hard, I felt great, you know? I thought this was the best talk I've ever given. <laughs> People took me to lunch, and there was other offers to speak, and, and things like that. Um, and so there's the question of, of how do you reach those who don't agree? And this is my second point, and the first being that we have to talk to others than those who already agree with you. The second point is that we need to reach out to those who don't agree. What I found the secret to doing that is, is to go to where they are. It's interesting. I was um, I was talking to Professor Shea's class. Uh, it was Friday, and one of the we were talking about witnesses and how to treat witnesses uh, and victims as witnesses. And one of the points I was making is that if you have a victim witness and you want to really have that person talk to you and tell you the truth and be comfortable, don't have them come to your office. Go to where they live, look what's on the wall, see what they find compelling. Is there a beautiful garden in their yard? Is there a picture of their children? Are they pursuing a degree in nursing? You'll find those things out if you go there and see the context of where they live. And that pays off in a lot of ways because you have that deeper understanding. And they'll hear you and you can hear them. When I want to advocate for somebody that I care about, I have to be very careful that I place it somewhere that my audience is going to include people who don't agree with me or who haven't made up their minds. Um, when I write about commutation, for example, which is shortening sentences, which is something I've done a lot of work on, um, for the most part, I try to reach out to conservatives on that. And I found an incredible audience, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. We had a, we had a, a session at the Heritage Foundation uh, 
um, once I started to raise this, I, I called the Heritage Foundation and <coughs> and uh, said, you know, I, I'd like to talk to someone about this project that I've got, um, where we're trying to get the president to release thousands of people who've been over sentenced for crack crimes. And they said, well, we'll set up a meeting. So I went to the meeting, and there was Ed Meese. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I'm sitting there with Ed Meese, who in the house I grew up in, might, might as well have been Satan. <laughs> <laughs> my dad, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's not a lot of warmth for, for Ed Meese. But I sat down and he said, so you were a prosecutor? I said, yeah, we talked about it. We talked about being a prosecutor back in the Alameda County. And we started talking about cases, and then we started to talk about conversations. And that's how we ended up having a symposium at the Heritage Foundation that was for broader communication, for reform of a system that wasn't working. And that has so much more impact than doing it someplace where everybody's going to say, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's do that because the, the crack laws were always wrong. Um, the other thing that I'll talk about in a minute that links into this principle is not only physically going to where people are who disagree with you or where there's a pool of people who haven't made up their mind yet, it's important to go in principle to where they are. Start with one of their principles or some area of overlap. I often think of a Venn diagram. That you remember those from fifth grade, or whatever. You know, there's the intersecting circles. Where is this the intersection? Um, one of the things that I've done related to that is, as I was saying before, I'm against the death penalty. I've been against the death penalty for a while. And I think it's an important issue. Um, so, how do you change people's minds about that? In the year 2000, I moved from, from Gross Point, Michigan, where Mark and I grew up, uh, to Waco, Texas. <laughs> it, it was. You know, you know, I was there for 10 years. Um, I met some wonderful people. It was a it was a uh, an alien place in a lot of ways. I mean, the, the, the culture and the, the food, uh, everything was different, and certainly the politics were. Uh, and I remember one morning, um, there was an execution and on, a, on a Saturday night, I think it was. And they used to have parties outside the prison at Huntsville. And people would celebrate an execution. And there was a story about the person who was being executed. And one of the things it featured, and this was very often true, in the lead of the article was the last meal that the executed person had. And, and you know, it was, there's, this, there's going to be a cheeseburger and a cupcake, Dr. Pepper, it's Texas. Um, and it, it just stuck in my mind. And then I went to church. And as we do here, I put my hands out, took the Eucharist, and realized this is the last meal of a condemned man. This is the last meal. What does that mean? That, that as a culture, we're fascinated by the last meal of a condemned person in Texas. There's three coffee table books about this. Okay. Picture of the guy, <coughs> picture of the last meal. Um, best I can figure is this. That the condemned man did something terrible almost always. Some people, you know, there's innocence questions sometimes, but usually they're guilty. They killed a child. They, they, they shot a police officer. They killed multiple people. Um, so what, do you, what connection do any of us have with that person? Well, cheeseburger, a cupcake, Dr. Pepper. We can look at that, and it's that one point of connection. And with Christ, symmetrically on the other side, a life that is perfected beyond what we're capable of. And what connection do we have with him? Isn't the power of our liturgy very much in that moment when the bread
red, the same red is in our hand. And so I realized that in Texas, the people who go to church are for the death penalty. And that's what I have in common with them. When we go to church, we put out our hand, we take that bread, and we take it seriously. And so I came up with the idea, which as an untenured faculty member at a Baptist school, might have done a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, of doing the trial of Jesus in a church on Sunday. I was the prosecutor. And, uh, and we did this, and it was, it was fascinating. I've been uh, doing it since then in a number of places. Uh, I, the defense attorney is a woman named Jean Bishop, who's a public defender in Chicago. Uh, and <clears throat> what we found is if we explain to almost any group that what we want to do is come to your state with the death penalty, uh, <clears throat> and we'll put on the sentencing phase of the trial of Jesus. Uh, and we treat it like a real trial. It's not a scripted play. We use witnesses who are drawn from the church or the, the college. And then I am I act like a real prosecutor because that's what I am. And Jean is a real defense attorney. I don't know who her witnesses are going to be or what she's going to argue, just like a real trial. Um, and then we divide the audience into groups of 12 and have them deliberate. Now we've done this at some very liberal places like the Episcopal Divinity School, where the challenge there was saying, here's a way to connect faith to social action. We've also done it at Regent University. At Robertson School in Virginia Beach. We did it at Fuller Seminary. We did it at Azusa Pacific. Uh, we did it in, in Oklahoma City uh, last year. And never once have I seen someone become angry, no matter how much they support the death penalty, because we're standing on common ground. We've gone to where they are literally, and we've gone to where they are on principle. That if nothing else, when we're talking, we're in front of an audience of Regent University students. They and us are standing on the Bible. We're telling stories from the Gospel. And that allows for a dialogue where it's almost a restart. You know, instead of yelling at each other, it's pushing things to the unexpected, unfamiliar territory. And that allows minds to change. And so that's really a <coughs> sort of slopped into the third principle, I guess, which is, um, which is start with their principles or with shared principles. Um, you know, I use the example of the Venn diagram. Uh, here's, here's something else, too, about that. Uh, I've watched a lot of good trial attorneys. I wish I could say I was one of them, but I'm not sure that's true. I lost a lot of trials. Um, but when I see really good trial attorneys, here's one of the things I see them do. Is that when they're giving their closing, we usually think of the attorney arguing at the jury. They're seated in the box, and the attorney is standing there and railing at them and doing all Sam Waterston. Uh, <laughs> but there's this very subtle thing I've seen the very best attorneys do, and that is that they'll start out by telling the jury, do you remember when this person took the stand and what she said? And as they're talking about it, they're walking towards the jury box and they're turning around and they're looking at the jury box and describing this key piece of testimony that that advocate wants those people to have in their mind when they get back to the room. But what's powerful about it is instead of arguing at them, they're telling a story and they're all looking the same way. That the advocate has turned around so that they're all facing the same thing. They're all reliving the same narrative that played out in someone else's voice. Um, we do that so rarely in public discourse in this country. We so rarely go to where the other side is, turn with them, and look at something. And I really think that our best hope of changing minds is to do that, to go to where they are. Um, 
understand their principles, even if we don't agree with them, and then turn and face the problem. And only then do you have a chance of them walking with you to where you want to go. Um, you know, with the gay marriage uh, initiative in Minnesota, uh, we ended up winning. We defeated that amendment. And in fact, uh, it, uh, it kind of backfired on the, the forces that proposed it because the turnout for the no vote brought in a lot of voters that the legislature flipped for both houses being Republican. <laughs> uh, but one of the things in that debate, trying to apply this, is that I went and asked the people who were for the amendment, including my, my respected colleague next door, why? You know, why is this something that matters so much to you? And what she said was, it's because of children, because we don't, we think it's damaging to children to have gay marriage. Um, both you know, to the specific children and to the general fabric of society in the way that it approaches children. Now, when I hear that, um, if my reaction is, that's not true, you don't really believe that, which is sometimes our instinct in situations like that, I'm not going to accomplish anything. I reject your base premise, I reject your religious principle, Good luck with that as advocacy. But if I accept that, and I do, I know this is someone who's, who is deeply committed to the welfare of children. What can, I, what can I say about that that starts from that principle? And the best I could come up with was this, and I think it was effective in some parts. Gay men and lesbians already have children. And if you think marriage is a good thing that stabilizes families, then letting the parents of a child, even if those parents are gay, be married to one another is going to be good for those children. And these aren't metaphorical children. These are children who exist right now who are the children of two men or two women. They have a name. They go to a classroom. Outside that classroom, there's a metal locker with their name on it where they keep their things. This is an actual child, and if their parents are married, then we both accept the proposition that marriage is best for kids. Then let's let that happen. And so starting from their principle, turning, and then walking someplace. Uh, does that always work? No. But telling <coughs> them that their principle is wrong never works. <laughs> or their interest never works. And in the end, when we when we prevail on one of these debates. It's never because we've convinced everyone on the other side. Um, you know, sometimes it's a swing that's, that's fairly small, and then other people come to that position in time. Um, the fourth thing uh, is that it's important to focus on outcomes. That is, what is your goal in the end? What do you want to accomplish? <coughs> And then let, let that structure what you want to do. Um, now that seems pretty simple, but when you look, think about it, so much of our advocacy isn't outcome focused. It's us focused. I know that's my instinct, is that um, if I get invited to give a lecture about the death penalty at Yale, at the same time, I get ready to give the death penalty lecture at Texas Wesleyan. Which one do I do? <laughs> well, I mean, I want to go to Yale, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I want to go there and have everybody know I'm speaking at Yale. And, but if I really care about an outcome, I'm going to know that Connecticut's already gotten rid of the death penalty. I'm going to, I'm going to go to Texas Wesleyan. Um, Another aspect of this, about focus on outcomes, that goes to a root problem in American advocacy, is that to really go to outcomes, you have to distinguish anger, even righteous anger, from effective advocacy. That there's so much on both sides of what's being said is an expression of anger. And that's never, that's very rarely good advocacy. 
where, I mean, think, think about just your own personal relationships. Usually we don't accomplish anything when we're yelling at each other. We accomplish something when both sides get tired and start talking. <laughs> <laughs> Which we warn each other out. Um, but, but that anger, it's important to recognize this. That there are people in this country who have a righteous anger, who have been denied and discriminated against and hurt by the things our society does. We know some of them. Now, I'm not saying to that person uh, that your being mad is illegitimate or that you shouldn't say that. But what I'm saying is that you need to distinguish that from advocacy. They have a thing in Texas that they do every year um, that is uh, kind of funny. They have a, a, a big anti-death penalty rally. And they go and they uh, march on the Capitol. And then they give speeches. And then they march and they yell at the Capitol. And it's, uh, it's Sunday, so no one's there. And there's a lot of anger. <laughs> but I'm not sure it's accomplishing very much. I remember in Minneapolis, if you remember Occupy Wall Street, uh, the, the local Occupy Wall Street went to a federal building and stood in front of the federal building and yelled at it. I, I don't understand how that's happening, we'll see. Um, because the building's not going to vote, unfortunately. Uh, and it's not that in those instances, what's being said, that anger isn't righteous, or that it shouldn't be said. Or even that those people shouldn't do those things. But I just don't want that to be construed as something that's going to achieve an outcome, the outcome that they want. That to do that, there has to be a humility, there has to be a love for our opponent that allows us to go where <coughs> they are and start there. Um, and that's, that's going to be very different. And, and uh, it's so hard not to add the angry part here. Uh, you know, whenever you find yourself saying, I just have to say this. <laughs> I, I've, I've learned that I, I have that phrase come through my head periodically and it almost always has taken me to a bad, bad place <laughs> at least in terms of that and I know that I have to, I have to sidestep away from that um, I was at a, a meeting at the Department of Justice in, within the last year on, on an issue that's important to me and we worked on it for a long time and it's uh, there's a, a penalty um, that's not commonly used in the United States, but in some states more than others, which is people who are juveniles are sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And so there's people as young as 14 who will be told they're never going to get out of prison. Um, and I think that's wrong. Uh, and so I advocate against that. I've associated with a bunch of other people who do. We got a meeting with some officials at the Department of Justice, so I went to Washington. and. Uh, I had figured that if we wanted to deter prosecutors from seeking that penalty, the best way to do it would be to get them to seek uh, uh, permission from main justice, from the Attorney General, because people don't want to do that. Uh, and so we were basically negotiating with DOJ to make that change and talking to, to people who could have a voice in that. But then, in the middle of it, one of our number just said, I just have to say this, <laughs> that you prosecutors created this problem. You know, I've known too many people that you just wanted to get. And you could just see all the air go out. And all the interest on the other side go away. Now, does that person have uh, you know, a good faith belief that some prosecutors do that? Sure. But saying that then, at that time, was really damaging. And so we have to separate it out. And not saying, you know, there's legitimate and illegitimate, but just what's effective advocacy and what's not. And sometimes the selflessness that's a part of effective advocacy is having that sense of restraint, of not saying that thing. Um, now, Professor Shea um, was a federal prosecutor just the same way, the way I was. And one of the things you learn when you are in that job is that kind of restraint. Because there's so many things you can't say, or else you might get a retrial. Um, but I see too little of that. 
in our in our broader society. The last thing, I guess it did work out to five more or less, um, is don't expect capitulation. That uh, you know, in trial, there's I, before I, I started trying cases, I had this idea that because I was the the prosecutor, what was going to happen would be that there'd be this point in trial where I'd put a witness on and I'd maybe be cross-examining the defendant who would start to cry and then admit the crime. <laughs> and the jury would go back and come back two minutes later with the conviction done. Um, that there'd be a capitulation, that my will would overbear their will. Uh, but that's not how anybody changes their mind. Think about something in your own life where you've changed your mind. And I'm willing to bet that it wasn't because someone came and argued you into it. It's because you heard a story, or you lived a story. Something happened in your own life. Or someone told you a story and led you through a narrative. Maybe someone argued something to you, and years later you realized they were right because of a situation in your own life. Um, that takes real humility to allow change without capitulation. Because we don't get the credit. Sometimes we don't know when we've troubled the water what those ripples are affecting. But we have to be willing to allow that, that it sometimes is going to be affected. Um, you know, in trial, for example, I was arrogant to think that my speech was the most important speech that was going to be made. Because I was always wrong. The most important speech, I'm not there for because it's the one that one of the jurors makes to convince the other jurors. And that was humbling to realize that I just had to put the facts out there and allow them to make a fair consideration. And that one of them was going to convince the others if there was a dispute. Um, now, there's a. I'm going to end and maybe allow some questions if we have time, but. Uh, there's a great story about this that I just became aware of yesterday. Um, and that is, I mentioned that I do this death penalty trial. And the uh, <coughs> defense attorney is a woman named Jean Bishop. Um, and she's particularly effective in the role of anti-death penalty advocate because 22 years ago, uh, she and her family met at a restaurant in downtown Chicago. It was her parents and her two sisters, Nancy and Jennifer. Uh, Nancy asked for a great meeting. Uh, and they had a great occasion to celebrate, which was Nancy was pregnant. It's going to be the first grandchild. So they had dinner. Nancy and her husband, Richard, went back to their home in Winneka, Illinois, a nice suburb of Chicago. And there was a 16 year old waiting for them with a gun. He shot the husband in the back of the head and then went after Jean's sister, Nancy. And uh, you know, from the way she was shot, it seems that she said, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. And he lowered the gun and shot her belly. And she died there. Uh, in her own blood, she left a heart in the unit. And so for Jean to be against the death penalty, when someone like that was eligible for it. It's remarkable. But there's more to the story, which is that he uh, he received the penalty of juvenile life without parole, uh, which I'm against. In fact, I testified in Congress in 2009 against that sentence. And the primary uh, witness on the other side, called by the Republicans, was Jean's sister, Jennifer. Um, well, if you go and look at the page of CNN.com this morning, you'll see Jean's article. Um, it's featured right at the top. Um, she wrote a piece about how she's come to change her mind about that. But that's not the end of the story either. There's something that's even more recent than that. Uh, that is that he never admitted to doing the crime. He never apologized. And there were times that, that the family approached him. When their father was dying, uh, Jennifer wrote to him and said, before he dies, can you at least admit to this crime and apologize for it? And he said, no. Um, 
but they kept going. And Jean wrote him a letter a couple weeks ago. Uh, and she got a response, I think Thursday for this week. And I asked her to email it to me. She scanned it in. And, um, Part of what he wrote is, I know that for a long time you and your family have been looking for me to confess to the murders I committed years ago. Of course, as you know, in the past I've always maintained my innocence. Well, for a lot of reasons which I'll get into in a little bit, I think the time has come for me to drop the charade and finally be honest. You're right, I am guilty of killing your sister Nancy. And her I also want to take this opportunity to express my deepest condolences and apologize to you. It's the first time in 22 years. Um, in the letter, he then goes on to explain why he changed his mind. Uh, and in part, I'm sure it was because he thought about Jean and Jennifer and their parents. But he also got married while he was in prison. Somebody wrote to him and said, uh, you know, I heard about, heard about you. They corresponded back and forth, a woman named Jessica. They ended up being married. Uh, but then she kind of just dropped from sight. Um, he thought she was involved with somebody else. And she never really told him what happened and they got divorced. And he says in the letter that that experience where all he wanted to know was the truth made him realize that that's how Jean and Jennifer were. No. So those times that they demanded and the court system demanded that he confessed. Yeah. It took the story, it took the broader scope of life to play a role as well. And that's how we change minds sometimes, is you keep writing letters. Uh, you keep thinking of different approaches. And there's going to be other things that come into play. And sometimes it works. And that's as good as it gets. Part of the humility that comes with social advocacy is realizing that you're not gonna win all the time, maybe even that often. And probably when you do convince somebody, they're not going to come up to you and say, boy, was I wrong, you were right. <laughs> but it's still worth doing. It's still what Christ commands us to do in so many of these areas. Um, and I think, in short, we just need to do it better. Mm -hmm. So, questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> is there a book uh, that you recommend on the subject? I mean, one book for stories. The other part of the question is how effective have you found over the years this uh, <coughs> practice of finding some little area where you, where two parties agree, even though they massively disagree in other areas? Towards arriving at some accomplishments, make, making some progress. Um, I think in the areas where it's been tried, it, it's often worked. Now, has it meant that one side got everything they wanted, or the other side got everything they wanted? No, but one side got some of what they wanted, and that's better than if the effort hadn't been made. Um, you know, you look, one of the things in Congress right now, you've got a lot of senators who've been quitting. And part of the reason that they're quitting is because they have the sense that this process doesn't work anymore. That, that there is no search for getting something done in that area of overlap. Um, so, I mean, there, within the realm of politics, there's a lot of examples that you can look at what used to work and what doesn't work and, and where we can go forward. Um, in terms of a block, I don't know. I mean, I, I wrote a book about the, the trial of Jesus, called Jesus on Death Row. You can get it on Amazon and stuff. But, but in terms of this, um, I, there, there may be one out there, but I, I, I don't know. Yes, ma'am. This is a little bit issue specific, but it's in Proverbs 22, verse 13. An issue so dear to my heart, I wanted to ask you about it. Um, administrative segregation. Um, what are we doing right, and what are we doing wrong? 
Yeah, you know, that's an area, administrative segregation or solitary confinement <coughs> in prisons. Mm -hmm. And the conditions that go with that, that's interesting. That's a, I'm glad you brought that up because that's an area where if I'm saying it's really important to speak to people who disagree with you or who don't have an opinion, that's an area where there's a lot of people who don't have an opinion. Because we don't think about people once they're in prison. It's like we put them in this box and they're in the box now and you know that's, that's done with them. So there's, in that area, it's different than a lot of these other areas where almost everybody has an opinion. Most people just don't think about it. And so there, almost any audience you talk to, you have a chance of winning them over simply by telling them what the facts are. Um, you know, here's how it's overused. Here's how financial incentives to private prison companies play into the use of administrative segregation and things like that. So there's areas like, like administrative segregation where if we want to do good, uh, it's, a, it's a right field because Simply saying what is is going to sway a lot of people who don't have an opinion yet, and it's going to make it important to them, or more important than it is right now, which is not important at all. Uh, it's something they care about, and so you know something, something like that. Simply writing about it, someplace where people are going to read it. I mean, almost any forum will work for that, where where people aren't thinking about it. Um, but it's a, it's an important issue. So, yeah. Where does the term come from? <coughs> I never heard that term before. Mm -hmm. It's well, solitary confinement sounded too harsh. Yes. And so, <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's also because there's no new practice in the administration. Yeah. I mean you think about it the I mean we call it a correctional system, but we don't make much effort to correct okay. people anymore either. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Yeah. Just a comment. Um, I never realized that if somebody is in the room where a murder is occurring and he had nothing, he was just there. Uh, we've supported a man for 35 years who's been at um, Marion Correctional, and he's up for parole, but he was always, always, always maintained that he was in the room, that he had nothing to do with the murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison. And my daughter, Melissa, that I mentioned, is working at it right now. The defense attorney is coming to see him tomorrow. But it's just amazing, just in the room. Mm -hmm. 35 years he's been in prison. Well, I mean, that's the, the, the charge, I'm sure, was conspiracy. Probably. Yeah. Well, something that we never heard of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and that's that's one of those areas where there's, there's so much uh, where there's people who are hurt or treated unfairly mm -hmm. where we don't think about it. I mean, one of the things that, that you know, I worked on for a long time was the, the over sentencing of people charged with, with crack cases. Uh, now, in part, I came to this point of view having been the prosecutor in a lot of those cases. In Detroit, that was what a lot of my cases were, were crack cases. And so, once I came to realize that that 100 to 1 ratio that we had in the sentencing guidelines and the mandatory minimums between powder and crack cocaine was doing bad things, one thing that we found was that people didn't know about it. Um, and so, you know, as with these two issues, simply putting information out there was, was pretty effective in terms well, of... I have to admit to all my good friends here that as much as I care for Michael, I really know it's the sense that he probably won't be able to leave the state if he's, even if he's released. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to see him at my back door if my husband mm -hmm. I would love to visit Michael, but I don't want him to come and visit me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's <coughs> yes, sir. I hate to call an end to this. Can we, no. let's just skip church and stay here? <laughs> Mark, we are so blessed to be here today. Thank you so much. Uh, is there a chance for me to leave? invite you back to do oh. the Jesus trial. Oh, yeah. I would, oh, yeah. I would yeah. love to do that. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I talked to the folks at the university about it, and I'm also going to talk to my parish. I'm a member of the Most Holy Trinity on the west side of Tucson, oh, yeah. and I think that the uh, Catholic Church should be uh, sponsoring this as well. It would be great to do that. And Gene Bishop is an unbelievable, oh, yes. unforgettable wow. person. And if we do that, what I would recommend to your church is try and separately have her come and talk mm -hmm. some yeah. evening. And it's something that um, mm -hmm. I've had her come to Minneapolis twice now, and students tell me it is, uh, for them, the most powerful presentation they've ever heard. So, we'll do it. We'll do it. Mark, thank you very much.